Our scripture reading today is found from one of the most familiar passages of scripture in the Bible, and one that is called the most beloved passage of scripture in the Bible, and I think I need to excuse our jammers at this time. I see them leaving regardless. <laughs> Bless your hearts, jammers. Thank you. I need those reminders. I get caught up in the service and forget. There they go, marching off like the troops around Jericho. I sure hope the walls don't come tumbling down. Okay, the 23rd Psalm, one of the most beloved passages of Scripture in all of English literature. Will you stand, please, for Psalm 23? The headings of the Psalms are part of the inspired text. We may or may not realize that, but they are, so I will begin there. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. This morning, I intend to just speak to you in an introductory way to the psalm in ways that I hope will make the psalm one that is cherished by you and hopefully motivate you to memorize it. One of the questions that I'm frequently asked, or was asked, by Matt Hunsaker when I begin a new series is, for how many weeks will this series last? He likes to arrange music that go along with the theme of the ser series, the title of the series. And I appreciate that from him very much, but the answer always is, Matt, I don't know. So for the next few weeks, we'll be looking at the 23rd Psalm, and usually my series go about five or six weeks. I think you know that. But by way of introduction, we notice the inscription first, a psalm of David. As I mentioned, these, are, these inscriptions are part of the text. And here we are introduced to the author, David. His name means beloved. Beloved by God, as he writes in the psalm, we learn of God's love for him and consequently of David's love for God. He writes in a personal way. Many of the psalms are psalms written about and to the corporate nation of Israel, the body of people, the children of the Abrahamic covenant. But here David writes in a personal way, and you'll notice repeatedly the first person is used. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and so on. The first person is used, and so we know that here David is reflecting upon, and we do believe that he writes this as a senior citizen. And here he is reflecting upon the years of his childhood when out in the fields of Judea he learned about God and he learned about shepherding. And there his heart was drawn to God, and there he learned what it meant to be a shepherd. And now, as he reviews his life, he looks back upon that life and the events of his life, and he says, hey, guess what, folks? God has been to me like I was a shepherd to the sheep. God has been to me like a shepherd. The Lord has been my shepherd. And now that I am older in life and I'm able to look back upon my life of the ups of the downs, the ins, the outs, the ecstatic experiences I had and the dismal experiences I had, I'm able to see that God has shepherded me. 
And because it is a personal psalm, God has shepherded me. It becomes personal for each and every one of us. Is the Lord your shepherd? Someone has said, God has no grandchildren. And with that remark is meant that while parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles or even older sisters and brothers or younger sisters and brothers might be devout Christians, that does not mean that you have come to faith in the Savior. You must make that commitment for yourself. God has no grandchildren. David made that commitment. And because he made that commitment, he is able to personalize God and say, he's my personal God. He and I have walked together in life, and he has walked before me. He has led me all the way. I have a collection of books by A.W. Tozer. He's one of the more influential writers to me and on my life. I probably own a dozen books by Tozer. Most of them are editorials he wrote for the Alliance Witness as a, the, a founder and editor of the newspaper for the Christian and Missionary Alliance churches. And there are a lot of quotes from Tozer, and if you would look it up on the internet, you would find Tozer quotes here and there and everywhere, and he was pretty good with a pen. But I think one of the remarks he makes as an introductory remark to his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, is one of the more profound thoughts we can come up to. You know what? I usually go back over this um, before the second service and make sure we're at clip number one. Sorry about that. But here's that remark penned by A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, a book on the attributes of God. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Mm. What comes into your mind when you think about God? David says, here's what comes into my mind. The Lord is my shepherd. Some scholars of a liberal persuasion, that is to say anti-supernatural or humanistic in their orientation, have written that <clears throat> there are two deities presented in the Bible. There's a God of the Old Testament and there is a God of the New. And the God of the Old Testament is wrathful and vengeful and judgmental and harsh and severe. And we don't like that. But the God of the New Testament is okay. He's kind and gracious and loving and good. Well, here we are in the middle of the Old Testament where those presumed scholarly individuals have said, God is angry and vindictive and mean and harsh. And what do we find this follower of that God saying? No, he's good. He's good. He's benevolent. He's gracious to those who follow him. The Lord is my shepherd. He takes care of all my needs. I will not want. Now we're going to get into those verses later and see exactly what they mean. But for our purposes now, let us understand that the God of the old and the God of the new is the same. And this morning as I conclude, I want to make that point. I'll make it now. The Lord speaks of his 
deity. Shepherd speaks of his humanity. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ, as is all of the Bible. And he is God of the Old Testament and God of the New. And he is the one we are to follow. It is true that the Old Testament emphasizes the holiness of God and the need we have for a Savior. That's why it's emphasized. God is just. Sin will be judged. And it's either judged in Jesus on the cross or you'll stand before God with your own sin on your hands to be judged. But the same God of the old is the God of the new of whom it is said, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He's one and the same. The old emphasizes to us the need we have of salvation. The new presents the Savior in all of his glory. And then the epistles tell us how to follow after him. But to those who were followers in the Old Testament, they learned soon of the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. To Abram was given a son and a tribe to follow him. To Joseph was given the rule of a kingdom and the opportunity to care for his father as his father aged and for his brothers in a time of famine. To David, the writer of the psalm, was given the rule of a kingdom and he ruled like a shepherd would rule for there in the hills of Judea he had learned the lessons of a shepherd. Have you ever tried uh, to wrap your mind around high school calculus? I wonder how many of us would be willing to take a high school calculus course now. Not me. I know my limitations, and calculus is one of those topics or subjects that just didn't appeal to me. It was pretty hard to wrap my mind around all of those mathematical formulas and abstract ideas. How much greater is it difficult then to wrap our minds around an infinite God? And so David in Psalm 23, a Psalm of David says, here's how we need to know him. Here's how we need to know him as our shepherd. And in weeks ahead, we'll begin to understand what it means to be a shepherd and to be a follower of the shepherd. Psalm 23, though, does not stand alone. I think it's important for us to understand that David, the author of Psalm 22, 23, and 24, here presents what we call a trilogy of psalms. And it's important for us to understand where this psalm is in that trilogy, in the middle, right? Yes, I know. But Psalm 22 is a psalm of the cross. In fact, the first few words of Psalm 22, and perhaps even the psalm in greater length, if not its entirety, was uttered by Jesus on the cross when he was dying. The Good Shepherd Psalm, based on John 10, where Jesus says, The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And Psalm 22 is a psalm of the cross, where the Savior gives his life for us. Psalm 23, the psalm under consideration for us, is called the Great Shepherd Psalm. It's the psalm of resurrection and intercession, which is why we're studying it at our church because that's where we are today. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He lives in heaven. He intercedes for us. This is the psalm of resurrection and of intercession. That's where we are. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, the scriptures say, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. Equip you with everything good for doing his will. So there you have the great shepherd, the resurrected Christ, 
interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. And as I've said, that's where we are today. That's why we'll study this psalm. But let us see its setting, because Psalm 24 is the psalm of the second coming, the psalm of glory. The chief shepherd, referred to in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, a reference to the second coming. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So here we have this trilogy of psalms. Psalm 22, the cross. Psalm 23, uh, resurrection and intercession. Psalm 24, the second coming. Very basic doctrine. But isn't it amazing how as we look at these psalms that David in his day saw this. He saw the Savior in these three offices of prophet, priest, and king. He saw him as the prophet crucified. He saw him as the priest making intercession. He sees him as the king coming again. And it reminds us that the biblical story and the doctrines of the Bible are repeatedly presented to us, and their focus is always on Jesus, the promised Savior of the old, the one who has come in the new, and the one who is coming again in the Revelation and in Daniel. I think I mentioned earlier that David was older when he writes the psalm. Now, there's no proof of that. But that is the considered opinion of scholars. And since I'm not a scholar, <laughs> I have to go by what they write. And since that's what they said, that's what I'll go with. Life had battered him. Do you feel like at times life batters you? Welcome to the club. He had bruises. He'd learned some lessons. And now, toward the end of his days, as he writes the psalm, he looks back and he says, God was there all the time. All I had to do was follow. And in this psalm, and again I say this is an introduction, and we'll be looking at this in greater detail, but in the psalm there's a very simple outline that is wonderful for all of us. Verses 1 and 2, David talks about the contentment of his soul, or the peace of God, it's called in Philippians 4, that passes understanding. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be upset. Don't be afraid. Don't be worried to death. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, because he's there. Remember this psalm is a psalm of resurrection and intercession? With prayer and thanksgiving, let your request be known unto Jesus. The text says God. And the peace of God shall keep. your hearts and minds. So verses 1 and 2, David writes about contentment. My soul is at peace. I've made my peace with God, and I'm experiencing the peace of God. Verses 1 and 2. In verses 3 and 4, he talks about the transformed mind. My thoughts are upon God. I've learned to think the way God wants me to think as I follow the shepherd. I have a transformed mind, Romans chapter 12. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know what is that good and that perfect will of God. Well, how do we know that? By following the Savior, by looking at his word. What does he say? And then in verses 5 and 6, David writes about 
the joy of his heart or how satisfying this life is. Not only is it satisfying here in this world of time, but it will be satisfying in eternity forevermore. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. From time to time, it is my privilege to officiate at a Christian funeral service. And I always consider that a privilege because I prefer to think about what the deceased as a Christian has gained and not what we have lost. It's a celebration of a homecoming. And while I don't hoot and holler so much because I know it's a somber occasion, yet I try to present to people the truth that when the Bible says, I will dwell on the house of the Lord forever, forever means forever. Your loved one is alive. Your loved one is well. And your loved one is dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. And so David writes, This way of life is very satisfying for me now. And how much more satisfying will it be forevermore? When my feet finally touch the banks of glory and I get out of this old rowboat called life in this world and I see Jesus, wow, talk about satisfying. That will be it. This psalm also, uh, the phrase, the beginning phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, a psalm of David, reminds me of the words of Jesus. And this was a thought I had as I was reading and praying and thinking about the psalm. It reminded me of the words of Jesus given in Matthew 11. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. We read that passage from Jesus, and we have a tendency, I think, because of the way it's worded in English, to think that's optional, or it's an invitation. It's like, come to my party, and you get the invitation in the mail, and you say, well, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Depends on what the weather will be. If it's four degrees above zero, I just might not go. But if it warms up some, then I'll think about going. The words that Jesus gives in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me, are not an option. They are actually an imperative, a command. And while I don't want to embellish the words of Jesus or add to the words of Jesus, I want you to know that what Jesus is saying in in English, for our purposes, is more like, you need to come, you have to come to learn how to live, to learn how to trust, to learn to have faith. You must do this. And after we come, what is it we must do? Take on the yoke. And what does that mean? Taking on the yoke is a learning experience. Last week, Mike, and thank you for speaking, Mike, and giving me a break. At the end of the year and the first of the new year, there's all this stuff, organizational stuff, that needs to be done at the church, so thanks. But Mike spoke on discipleship last week. And that's what taking on the yoke means. It's a learning experience. It's learning to live the right way. Now, I don't know a whole lot about oxen. I've read this, and I've read that, and I've heard this, and I've heard that, but I really have never been around an ox. I've heard the phrase, dumb as an ox, haven't you? So I don't think they're the most intelligent creatures. But I know what Jesus is saying. When I was a boy, my granddad had beagle dogs. He used to like to hunt. And sometimes he never even hunted, but he'd just take his dogs out and run them. 
what he called them. Just let them run. He loved it. They'd round up a rabbit and bring it back. And here came the little rabbit. Boom, 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 boom. Here came the dog. Baying, of course. Beagles don't bark. They go, ooh, ooh. He loved it, and I did too, just to be with him. But one thing I learned about his raising of beagles is that the way you train a young dog, a pup, to hunt is put him with an old dog. And the old dog who knows how to hunt teaches the young one how it's done. It's like the old dog says, okay, sonny boy, watch me. This is the way we do it. And that's what putting the yoke on means. When a young ox was to be broken in to take the plow through the field. They wouldn't yoke him up with another young ox. They'd go all over the place, buck, kick, run. They'd hook him up to an old veteran ox who knew what it meant to pull the plow. The young ox would be oxed up with the old ox. Apparently he'd look over and the old ox would say, now watch me, sonny boy, this is the way we do it. And they'd plow the field together, and the young one would learn from the old one how it's done. And Jesus says, hey, you want to learn about life? You want to learn how it's lived? Learn from me. I can teach you. I'll teach you how to do it right. I'll teach you how to do it well. Put the yoke on with me as your guide as your teacher, as your master. Learn from me. Learn from me what it means to live properly. Learn from me what it means to have faith. Learn from me what it means to have endurance. Learn from me what it means to have patience. Learn from me what it means to go through trials. Learn from me. Learn from me. Learn from me. And as we learn from him, what is it we learn David says at the end of this psalm, it's a satisfying life. Not only is it satisfying in time, but it's satisfying forever in eternity. The idea of the Lord our shepherd is a redundant theme in the Bible. Jesus used it, I am the good shepherd, John 10. In Isaiah chapter 40, in a reference to the nation Israel now, not a personal reference, but to the nation Israel, Isaiah the prophet says this in speaking of the Lord. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. The lambs can't walk as fast or as far as the adult sheep. The shepherd picks them up, carries them along. There are times when we need to be picked up and carried. But this is a theme in the Bible. God is our shepherd. So that being the case, we probably need to study that idea and know what it means. Now I have a lot of jots and tittles down here. and More jots and tittles than I have minutes on the clock, I'm afraid, because while I know you could sit here and endure it, or I'd like to think that, I don't think the infants and the children next door are quite so uh, prone to do that. But be that as it may, I have a picture of a ship anchored in a storm. And the Lord our shepherd, among other things, means that Christ is an anchor for our lives. An anchor when the going is difficult, when we're tempted to give up, when things just don't seem pleasant. We can always look to Jesus by faith. The eyes of our soul can look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and we can say, Lord, shepherd me through this situation. Lord, shepherd me at this time. Lord, Give me the confidence to know that as I follow you, that things are going to be all right. In the Judean hills, unlike the American West, shepherd 
don't drive their sheep. They lead them. The Lord is my shepherd means that Christ, as we follow him, he's already been in the situation. He walks ahead of us, and he makes sure that everything's going to be okay. For all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's draw a couple of conclusions. You've already (laughs) seen that since I didn't back up my slides, but we'll go through it again. Here's here's some conclusions I'd like us to draw from from David, a psalm of David. That's as far as I've gotten today, really, a psalm of David. And I've given you some, some thoughts, but here's one thing. Whoops, not that, this. The shepherd cares for the sheep. If nothing else, you should have certainly gotten that from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He cares about me. About me? There was a time in the Psalms that David cried out, no man cares for my soul. That's how alone and isolated and forgotten he felt. He had experienced betrayal from the hand of a friend. He was having all kinds of a range of emotions trying to deal with that and come to a resolution in his own heart. But now he looks back and he says, well, God, you were leading me there. You were there all the time. I just didn't know it. But you were there. And now I know you care. You care for me. John 10, Jesus speaks of himself as the good shepherd because he cares for us. Second point, being a shepherd is a a 24-hour-a-day job. When at nighttime the sheep would be put in the fold, the shepherd would lie down at the gate. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I am the door, I am the door to the sheepfold. If you're going to be one of God's sheep, you have to come through me. No other way. It's a a 24-hour-a-day job. For my own personal study this year, my own personal devotion, I don't mind telling you, I don't like to talk about myself too much, but I want you to know I'm studying through the life of Jesus. I've decided I'm going to do that this year. So I'm studying the life of Jesus. And just recently I read about the shepherds who were watching over their flock by night. And one of the commentators made the point, and it sort of resonated with me. He made the point, these lonely, exiled shepherds. And I thought about that. Those were the descriptions given, the adjectives. Lonely, exiled. They were not able to leave the flock. They couldn't go up to Jerusalem for the feast. They couldn't uh, go home to see mom and dad. These lonely, exiled shepherds. Interesting description of the shepherds who were watching the sheep outside Bethlehem the night Jesus was born. Lonely. Exiled shepherds. Being a shepherd is a 24-hour-a-day job. But God's on the job 24-7. And aren't you glad? I will lift up mine eyes, Psalm 121 says, unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He will not suffer my foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. God's on the job. No matter what time zone you're in, if you're an international traveler, uh, no matter what time of day or night, God's there to hear 
to help, to heal, to lead, to comfort, to inspire. So bring yourself to him. And thirdly of all, Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. Lord means deity. Shepherd means humanity. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about Jesus, the great I am. That's who we're talking about. That's who David knew. That's who David followed. That's who was David's shepherd, and that's who wants to be your shepherd as well. And so I close with that. Do you know Jesus? Are you following Jesus? I trust you are. Shall we pray? And as we go to prayer this morning, perhaps there are friends here today with needs in your life. We would not want to close the service without an opportunity being given you to act upon those needs. At the front of the worship center will be Rick Grissom. And as we close this service, and as some of you will leave to get your children and others will leave just to go to your automobile and some will linger to visit. Some of you will have a need. You're here and you don't know Christ. Or you're here and you do know Christ and you have a concern, a prayer need. Or you have a question about life or about the church. Rick is here to help you and to answer that question and to pray with you. Give him the opportunity to minister to you. Dear Father, today we have looked at these introductory thoughts to the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is My Shepherd, a Psalm of David, a man who writes now at a stage of life where he's older, and as he looks back upon his childhood, his young adulthood, and then his later adulthood as king, and as he views the various episodes of his life, some very joyous and victorious and others very dismal and disappointing, yet he is able to say, the Lord, he was there for me. He shepherds me. He's taken care of me. And not only has he taken care of me now, but he will take care of me forever. May you go forth today with the inspiration and the encouragement and the joy that this psalm rightly should bring to your heart. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all until our Savior come and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed.